speed dating. In snap judgment, as I'm reading excerpts from our submissions, our judges will decide if they'd keep reading or not, and then they'll tell you why. No one is here to be mean or discouraging. The judges' critiques are meant to help you hone your craft and to answer that age-old question of, what is a magazine editor really looking for? We received many more stories than we could ever hope to get cover in 90 minutes. So your entries were randomized, and we will go in the order that fate has set. Apologies if we did not get to your work. Before I introduce today's judges, have you seen the Apex Magazine Kickstarter? This Kickstarter will fund the magazine through calendar year 2022, and the good news is our first goal has already been met which means we are guaranteed to publish issues 127, 128, and 129. Oh, but you want more shocking and surreal fiction? More science fiction and dark fantasy? You want more essays, interviews, and artwork? We've got a little ways to go yet, and we need your help to get there. Visit apex-magazine.com and follow us on Twitter at apexmag for more information. The Kickstarter runs through August 18th. And now, back to Snap Judgment. Please join me in welcoming today's judges. Today's guest judge is Mike Allen, publisher and editor and author, publisher and editor of Mythic Delirium Books and the popular Clockwork Phoenix anthology series. We also have Leslie Connor, Apex Magazine's managing editor and author of the historical dark fantasy novel, The Weight of Chains. Last but certainly not least is the man with the titanium jaw, the editor-in-chief of Apex Magazine and owner of Apex Publications, Jason Sizemore. As a reminder to the audience and our judges, as I'm reading each submission, the judges will raise their hands when they'd stop reading. I stop when all three hands are up or when I get to the end of the excerpt, whichever comes first. Excerpts are approximately 250 words, so this is going to go fast. And then we'll have a short critique conversation before I move on to the next excerpt. Judges, are you ready? Sure. Yes. Bring it on. Let's, let's go. There were dead flowers by the foot of my parents' grave, the same kind as the living ones I held in my hand, jasmines. No one found their bodies after their disappearance while on a trip to the neighboring village, so their grave took the form of a Fokienia with their initials marked on its aged bark. When I reached toward them, I found my fingers passing through the wilted petals, expecting them to crumple, but they turned into wisps of smoke instead, dissipating. May. Two disembodied voices whispered my name, the voices grainy, cracking, bouncing echoes in my ears. I felt the hairs on my head tug against my scalp, rising with the goosebumps skittering across the rest of my body. From behind the Fokienia, my elder sisters stepped out of the shadows. Their hair sat light, like lank black streamers, greasy ribbons down their chalk white face, as though someone had splashed white paint over their entirety. Their bodies donned a simple white dress, floating at their ankles. There was no white to their eyes, only black and rimmed red. The smiles on their faces stretched wide, revealing teeth that were straighter than when they were alive, symmetrical cubes that looked glued on. Er, Ming, I called my sister's names. Er, the character in Sun, was the eldest. Our parents had high hopes that she would be born male. Oh. No raised hands on the first one. Very good. Very good start. Uh, so some of the things I noticed that I liked in this um, was the mood and the tone. Um, the uh, introduction of um, immediate creepiness. Uh, it really worked for me for a horror piece. Um, I would continue reading. Um, there's uh, not really a whole lot uh, for me to pick apart on this one. I, I like the uh, the setting, the word choice, um, the description of the uh, elder sisters. So 
although I was kind of hoping to be able to tear apart the very first story that we did. Um, I'm afraid that um, unless I was going to be nitpicky, I, I have nothing really harsh to say about this one. Good job. Yeah, I agree. I'm I'm definitely curious as to where it's it's heading. Like that's when you finished reading, that's where I was at. Was like, okay, well, where are we going? Um, because especially since we're at the parents' grave, but we're seeing what seems to be the sisters' apparitions. So I'm I'm very curious about that. Like you know, you would assume if you're at the parents' grave, those are the go. Like that's what I thought was going to happen. Um, the only thing that I would really see, say is maybe read through it out loud once or twice because there seemed to be a few places where Andrea was kind of stumbling and reading. Um, and those are the types of things that it can really help you catch where you maybe need to tweak some wording um, and the pacing a little bit is if you're reading through it and if you're finding you're stumbling, especially in the same place, that's a really good indicator that maybe that line needs to be reworked just a little bit. So that would really be my only major critique there. I'm very curious where it's going. So good job. Uh, I agree with what Leslie just said about uh, word choice. You know, I, I would keep reading, most certainly. I'm very intrigued by the premise this sets up. This this The final sentence where the narrator's response to seeing Ur's ghost is to give us some background information about her. I mean, that might be fine, but that implied to me that, okay, this is not like a stress situation for our narrator. This is something that maybe happens every time she comes out to the grave, uh, <laughs> you know, so she has time to think about, yeah, you know, you, you know, Ur had it rough when she was alive. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, depending on how that is handled, that could get even more intriguing for me. Thank you, judges. Let's move on to our next submission. Cartographer Tosji passed beneath the reaching branches of the Spearwoods canopy for the last time and found another village home missing. The plot where the house had stood beside the trail was empty of anything touched by the hand of mortal folk. Except for the Sherwood's power humming beneath his feet, it could have been any forest edge, meadow grass, shrubs, young trees. The last time he'd emerged, he'd been greeted by the house's cheerful riot of a garden, full of children and dogs and shrieking laughter. The butterflies floated from flower to flower. The last bright remnants of summer had reminded him of home, of Parvana. A ragdoll lay forgotten in the verge. The spearwood had fed. Toschi's wagon was a little further down the trail. A nomadic childhood memory repurposed as his own mobile scriptorium. It was cozy and safe, as a rented room under the shadow of a spearwood stand could never be. Naker flew ahead of him to the roof tree and roused all their white feathers, quirking warning. The wind was rising, a storm boiling up over the spearwood in a thick charcoal curdles of cloud. I know, Toschi told his raven familiar. I'll have to work quickly, this one is strong. The white raven quirked again, peering over the edge of the curved roof to watch as Toschi drew a sigil on the door with a charred stick. Protection and peace in elegant knotted swirls, made all the more potent by using a piece of the spearwood itself. Excellent reading, Andrea. Thank you. Um, so secondary world fantasies uh, probably aren't uh, my strongest areas when it comes to um, critiquing. Um, mostly because I just don't read a lot of them. Um, but I will say that uh, for me, this one was mostly effective. Uh, the opening four paragraphs uh, that end with the Spearwood had fed uh, was fairly effective. Um, it definitely raised questions in my head and did propel me to want to read on. Um, the introduction of Taji felt uh, a little abrupt for me. And 
and I thought it was kind of clever how the reveal Nakri was that he was a raven um, was kind of neat. Uh, for some reason, I had it in my head that Nakri was some kind of magical being that had um, jumped up into you know the the roof tree. So um, I don't know if that bit of misdirection was intended or if that's something you may want to clarify up front. Um, I agree. I, I mean, I don't read a lot of fantasy of this type, so I'm having a, a, a little bit of a hard time with whether typically when these types of stories come through in the Apex Slush, I find that I read farther than I might with other genres because it's not my preferred genre to read, especially like for pleasure. Um, so I don't have a firm grasp of what the genre should have. Um, the only sort of things that I'd really say is I felt there were a few times where the sentences were just maybe like the description was just maybe a slightly too wordy that it could be again tightened up just to, just slightly to make it um, flow a little bit better. But other than that, I felt um, that it did a good job. So I would definitely keep reading past this. Uh, I I had a couple of nitpicks uh, that may or may not have proved to be important as we kept going. Um, the the very cool opening, uh, there's a statement, uh, the plot where the house had stood beside the trail was empty of everything touched by the hand of mortal folk. But then, uh, but then two paragraphs later, a rag doll lay forgotten in the verge. So, okay, there is something there touched by mortal folk. So, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, the, 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 the writer might want to consider, you know, having Tazji notice you know the rag doll or, or something like that so that the so that the inconsistency is smoothed over um the second part again i i would have continued reading but i wasn't really clear if the if if the second half of this hook was was actually following the events described in the first part or whether we had gone into a flashback i didn't I didn't see any guideposts uh, to to explain what was happening there. So uh, again, I would have read further to find out, but that might also be something for the writer to think about. So uh, the reader should probably be grounded a little bit better in uh, when exactly right the the heart of the narrative is starting. Yeah, I agree with that completely. Good observation. That's all for me. All right, let's move on to our next submission. Tachi was born not from a womb, but from Zir's mother's severed heart. The howling queen Nohali cut the aching organ from her chest and abandoned it, still beating, to rot in the Meridian Valley while she waged war on her fellow gods. But it did not rot, no. It burrowed roots deep into the earth and grew to the size of a blood melon, then a barrel orchard, then a corpse flower. After a year and a day, the heart swelled to bursting and Tachi leapt from it fully formed. Z stared at the world around them in wide-eyed wonder. The jade green grasslands and sapphire blue sky were beautiful, yes, but also achingly empty. Z longed for companionship, so Z followed the sun's westward crawl in search of someone to call friend. As the sun sank below the horizon, Z came upon the ruins of a village. All of the houses had burnt. The central well was choked with ash. Charred skeletons littered the streets, a testament to the heat of the fire that had consumed them. On the far side of the village, a lone corpse remained unburned, tied to a pair of crossed poles that yawned up from the ground like a massive X. Its intestines had long ago been spilled out on the ground for the crows and vultures, and its eyes picked from their sockets. Tachi wept for the dead. 
Had these people lived, Z could have befriended them. Their deaths seemed senseless, wasteful, even cruel. Uh, well, you had me until um, the last paragraph. I, I don't know why. Uh, it shattered the mood for me. It just seemed kind of weird that Tachi would be weeping for these people. Maybe I'm a cold-hearted bastard and have no empathy. Uh, that you know, that could be it. But um, I mean, he's like this god that just sprouted out of someone's severed heart. The lives of mortals would seem like it would be kind of below zero. Uh, so, uh, but the everything surrounding up until that point, I thought really worked, especially your use of colors. Uh, it, it was just very strong and, and evocative, and um, definitely I thought the strongest part of this introduction. Um, It, it's interesting that Z wanted uh, companionship, so I guess maybe that ties in to Tashi weeping for the dead, just because he's weeping for what he could have had. But it, I, I don't know. Uh, I, but I'd have to read a lot more, which to. Um, to get a better grip of how I really feel about this little selection. Um, but that also is a good thing because that means, yes, I would read on. So well done. Um, I, I really enjoyed the first sentence. I thought the first sentence was great at like hooking the reader in. Cause you're like, okay, so they're burned from the severed heart. You know, that's a, a great image. Um, where I started to get a little bit lost is, yes, they burst forth fully formed, but they're awfully knowledgeable for have never had any experiences. Like, like I just kept going, well, companionship, well, they wouldn't have any idea what companionship is. So how can you, if you don't know what something is, how can you want it? Um, and then you know, going to the village and, and seeing these corpses and they're weeping for them. But again, it's like, where did the knowledge come from that that this isn't just how things are? Um, so I, I found myself jotting down notes like, well, OK, well, how would they know what that was? Well, how would they? So I just need just like even it would one line or a couple of words that would explain that. I, I get that they're fully formed, but even being fully formed, where did the back knowledge come from, the, the knowledge of the world? Because that that's really where I was kind of like, okay, when you first said fully formed, I'm going, yeah, but we're going to get to see how they kind of learn about stuff or get an explanation. And there was no explanation. So my mind's trying to figure that out, um, which once my mind starts trying to figure something out, it's very hard for me to then continue to focus on what you're actually saying because I'm searching for that clue. Um, so that would be my thing is that, that where did that knowledge come from immediately? Because that's kind of where so I was. Where it was the character's sense of wonder. <laughs> the character is a blank slate and right right the character is a blank slate and you know you can be fully formed but still have no knowledge of the world you're fully formed and in, in being birthed into um so where did that come from and because otherwise your reader is going to be trying to figure it out rather than paying attention to what's actually going on right I, i'm not normally a fan of openings that are basically info dumps but the details of this particular opening is, even though it's basically an info dump, are really, really interesting. But I, I have the exact same issue that Leslie and Jason are describing. When we, when we get to the death seems senseless, you know, and so uh, Z weeps. Well, uh, we've not learned anything about who Z is as an entity up to that point, and so that seems very jarring, you know. Um, Maybe in the next few paragraphs, it's going to be uh, explained further 
or you know maybe maybe there is room in this really compressed almost info dumpy opening to 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 spread it out a little bit and give us some of those uh e extra details about who tachi is as a personality and those are my thoughts <laughs> those are good thoughts all right thank you very much let's Let's go to our next submission. I wasn't going to say goodbye, but with Dawn's fingers brushing Ree's warm forehead, I can't help kneeling by her bed and saying, wake up, darling, Ma's going out. Jer's looking at me like she told me so, and why'd we have that whole fight for? I ignore her because Ree's eyes are open just a bit now, and that means I've got maybe 30 seconds before she curls her hand around her rainbow knit crab and drifts back off to sleep. Ma's going out, Ree says in that muttery, tired kid voice. When's Ma coming back? Um, I make the mistake of glancing back to Jer, who won't look at me anymore. She's stirring something over the fire, something I wish I'd be here to eat in a couple hours. Might be a while before I come back this time, kiddo. How long's a while? A couple weeks? Maybe a couple months? Maybe never? Her whisper hurts more than that hex I had caught in my throat for a month once. I thought it was a bad cold. Should have known better when I was dealing with a pissed off blood witch, but still. I plan to kiss on Ree's sleep sweaty forehead. I'll be back, baby girl. I always come back. Go back to sleep, huh? She fishes under her soft blue blanket and holds out the knit crab. Bring him with you. Your crab? He's a good luck crab. I hesitate. We do have one hand raised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's because I'm mean and, and don't like, you know, kids and stories. <laughs> You're so mean. <laughs> no, not, not at all the case. I just... Um, I just don't feel like this is a very effective scene to open a story or a novel with, um, especially a fantasy piece. Uh, I would prefer that we actually uh, know the protagonist a little bit and maybe the protagonist's relationship with the kid. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is I feel like the story should start a little bit before this scene. Perhaps with not a prologue, but some kind of uh, situation that the main character has to address or discuss, or there's some kind of discovery of something that she has to take care of um, to lead us in. With, maybe the argument with Jer. I mean, obviously, this is there has been a conversation ahead of this because they're saying you know why'd we have the whole fight for well okay why did you have the fight where are they going um and why you know why are they leaving their their kid behind um obviously it's something that happens uh you know often and often enough that the kid and, and it's dangerous because the kid's asking how long are you going to be gone are you never coming back well, I mean, I think children, for the most part, have this absolute faith that their parents are always coming back no matter what. Um, they may not, it may not be soon enough for them, but they don't usually think mom or dad's not coming back. Sorry yeah. to jump in there. <laughs> no, no, you are, that was a fantastic point. And that's a really good suggestion as perhaps the, proper starting point for this work i'm i'm going to do something that did not happen in our rehearsal and i'm going to disagree slightly with jason and leslie oh, oh my god yeah 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 so so i actually this very opening uh you know with with the with the child with this sort of stressful parting with the child that was actually working for me now my and I, I felt like that could go places, depending on what the 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 total the shape of the story turns out to be. Now I will say my hand twitched, but didn't come up when we got to the paragraph 
you know, her whisper hurts more than the hex I caught in my throat for a month once, because that seemed like uh, that that seemed like this almost this this almost snarky info dump aside that suddenly got inserted into what could be, you know, a fairly touching scene for this kind of story. And that that paragraph also uh, began to make me think, oh, OK, well, maybe this situation here sounds like sort of the typical, you know, warrior witch goes out, has adventures thing, you know, and that's been dropped into something that so far was feeling kind of fresh to me. So uh, but my hand didn't go up and I kept reading and I and I would keep reading you know, even if the even if the crab thing, you know, the the stuff crab thing is 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 a bit on the sentimental side, I was still going to keep going. Um, yeah, I think it, maybe a little bit has to do with who the target audience is for this story. I mean, if this is a general high fantasy, I don't think this intro works at all. But if this is like a YA fantasy, then it probably does. Um, the one other thing that kind of pinged at me while we were reading is there's no indication really of what Ree's age is. Um, and I would kind of like to have that information. That's a great, that's a great point. Because um, the difference between a, a four-year-old's reaction and, say, a seven-year-old, both of which are ages where they could still be sleeping with a stuffed animal and believe that that stuffed animal it provides some sort of protection there, but there's a vast, vast difference in what a child is like at that age. So that's just something that as I was reading, I'm going, okay, well, is this a preschool age child or are, are we talking just a few years older where the knowledge of the world is just a little bit wider? Um, so I think that that might be, if you can get that sort of information in there in this scene, that might really help your readers kind of feel more grounded in what is going on between this mother and child. Excellent feedback. Thank you. Let's move on. I overslept on the day of my father's funeral. Surprising, since I had been planning it for the last few years. Neither the emergency lamps nor the alarm woke me up, so I just opened my eyes in the red room, briefly unaware of place or time. I sat, hair stuck on the cheek by my drooling. Awakenings, on a morning or afternoon, were reserved for the pain. For a long time, I tried to solve it, to put a neat little tag and shelve it, but like the monsters outside that bunker, it could only be contained. And I did so by allocating grief like a meeting on a schedule. As soon as I was awake, it came down over me in irradiating, searing pain from the chest and outwards until they stopped at my feet and fingers. My body contained that pain, just like those concrete walls contained the rest of the world. The clock showed PM. Good thing I slept on my lab coat. The coffee machine was broken, so I punched it. People side-eyed me, disgusted, sure, but not surprised. When I came here, I was daddy's girl. Then I became his shame. Poor doctor, what's his name? From what I had gathered, right now my title was divided in two groups. Civilians thought of me as that arrogant, unkept slob from the labs. My colleagues had a better opinion of me. To them, I was just insane. We have one hand raised. Uh, so my hand twitched a few times. Um, I found that the opening was a bit of a word jumble. And, and then at times, oddly, it was kind of poetic. Now, I don't know if it was because of the wonderful job you were doing narrating it. Um, this this narration, I hate to kind of jump in with my thoughts, but this narration, I really struggled with what direction to go with this. Mm -hmm. So okay, uh, but I also I, I did like uh, the tone and, and um, 
although it was kind of an overly familiar tone, uh, one of the ways to get it, the, the quickest ways to get a rejection from me is if it's um, a story with just an unhappy character being unhappy. And at times, this Carol came to that cutoff line for me very closely, but then it would do something interesting. Uh, I would suggest um, tightening the pros. You know, you hear people say tighten the pros. Well, this is one of those examples where I think tightening the pros would help. Um, You also hear, you know, don't start a story with someone waking up. That's kind of cliched advice. But in this example, I think you would do yourself a service if you move the beginning of the story up just 10 minutes, you know, past the waking up. Because I don't really don't think we get much from that bit. Um, what, what's your thoughts there, Leslie? I almost raised my hand at that first sentence because I'm going, oh, we're waking up. The only thing that saved it for me was, okay, it's on the day of their father's funeral and they've been planning it for months. Yeah, that Um, line saved it for me too. That's for the few years. They've been planning it for the last few years. Okay, so that right there, that part is what kept me reading. But... I was not there with that that main character. I just kept thinking, why are you whining? Like you're like you're you're whining. And yeah, I know, like believe me, first thing in the morning, I probably come off as whiny and mean, but especially if the coffee maker's broken. But as a reader, to to just immediately be thrown into that and you don't have any affection for that character already. I was just kind of a little bit like, ugh, like you're not selling me on this character. Um, and again, the thing that got me through it was it's okay, it's the day of the father's funeral. And I just kind of kept waiting for more information on that and it wasn't coming. Me, me too. Me yeah, too. Yeah, like I I I that's what I was invested in is you're you're waking up late on the day of your father's funeral that you've been planning for years okay well why and we don't know and so yeah i i i wanted less whining about what people called them and more okay well why have you been planning your father's funeral for years have they is it been a long drawn out you know illness was are you just the kind of person that hates their father and so you start planning really early even though they're not you know their demise has not come like why were you planning it so long so that's what I was wanting and then, and we didn't get that well my hand went up because we we got to the end of this first segment and and I want to I I, I, I want to add that that as a as an editor and publisher I am somebody who has occasionally picked and published and showcased stories that had very bewildering openings, which is which, which is what this strikes me as 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 it's kind of going for. But uh, for I got to the end of this first section, and and my thought was, and understand, I'm I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just kind of under, I'm just trying to reveal how the editor brain works. My thought was, I don't understand what just happened. And I don't care. And so my <laughs> and so my hand went up. Uh, you know, I I think there is an intriguing situation kind of buried in here that, that could come out with some polishing. Uh, and that would keep me reading. Uh, although I did worry about this this the the next piece we went into Im- implied that we're going into mad scientist type stuff. And, you know, I, I do, that's a hard, not that I'm the one who would be buying this story, but that's a really hard sell for me, a mad scientist story. I mean, you know, talk about something that's been done a lot. Uh, so that's what I have to say. Good stuff. Um, so what, 
after every five stories, we switch up who will be going first on their critiques. And so for this next one, Leslie will be going first and Mike will go second. Jana lugged the old tea cart to Kimsey's central plaza before dawn. Its wheels caught in the cobblestone, threatening to throw the samovar, but today of all days, she would follow the customs. She lit the gas burners, bringing the water to temperature, careful not to look at the corpse arranged on the stone platform. A single drone buzzed around her mentor in a circle guarding the body. She had petitioned for nine days of respect and the full guard of seven drones for a tea man who had walked the streets of Kimsey more than 50 years. The assembly had granted three days and one drone, claiming generosity in that. Everin had no family and Jana had no money. The body was clogging the plaza and there weren't enough flowers to mask the scent of decaying flesh. As the sun rose, she unscrewed the jar of dragon blossoms and buried her nose in it. She took out each twist of tea and unrolled it in her fingers, a trick Everin had taught her. He insisted the salt of the hands brought out the flavor of the tea. Now Jana wondered how strong the flavor would be with the salt from her tears smeared over her fingers. As the brew turned sweet and dark, she added a handful of fresh tamurkuk. She hated the bitter flower before Everin took her in, but he had taught her how the bite accentuated the sweetness. Sorry, I had myself muted in case I coughed. Um, I'm kind of torn on this one. I I do like the imagery overall that this one is kind of evoking because you know you have Zana lugging this tea cart um, and immediately you know the, the the wheels are getting caught and. She, but they're, she's going to follow the customs. And immediately at the end of that first paragraph, we, we see that there's a corpse arranged on a stone platform. So, you know, I'm wanting to know, you know, why? Why is there a corpse on the platform? Like, what are the customs that they're leaving this out where in the central plaza? Um, and then you get that little sci-fi part of it because there's a drone buzzing around guarding the body. Um, I liked that. Um, I did have a, a, a very moment of ooh when she's rubbing the tea between her fingers and she's talking about her tears being smeared in it. And I'm imagining her her serving this to other people. Um, so that immediately I was like, oh, gross. Um, but overall, I'm, I'm a little, I, I am curious as to why um, we're leaving a corpse in the central plaza of this village. Um, and I like overall the the imagery that it, we're getting of this person that's coming to be beside this corpse and, and to make the tea that they've obviously taught her to make. Um, but it, it maybe was just a little too um, slow getting started. Yeah, my feeling was that it's a gorgeous opening scene, but I didn't get to the end uh, with any sense that I that uh, a story had started. Um, a, and I, the, the I'm I'm just going to nitpick a little bit. There, there's a word choice thing. The body was clogging the plaza. I, I thought that was very strange because clearly the body's not stuffed in a drain. That, that kind of kind of kind of made me wonder what image the author was trying to evoke. But but you know I let that go for the moment. But the very end, uh, I'll be curious if Jason, you know, has similar thoughts. But we we at the very end we she starts like sort of reminiscing. She had hated the bitter flower before Evren took her in. Uh, but he had taught her how how the bite accentuated, and I thought, no, well, now wait a minute. A story still hasn't started, and we're starting to reminisce. You know, as as an editor, as as an editor, I almost always shut down. The, you know, the moment that starts happening, it's just like, okay, well, <laughs> you know, we we still don't have a story yet, and now we're doing flashbacks. You know, let's let's 
let's let's let's let's let's find out what this story is going to be about before we start doing this. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I raised my hand because uh, as we hit that last paragraph, I had no idea what the conflict, if there was going to be one, um, was going to be or what the story was even about. Um, for short fiction, you just, even if you are having kind of a, even if you're writing a very um, low key piece of work that may not have, that may be more non traditional and not filled with um, the, you know, the typical story uh, points, you know. You still got to give the reader something to bite into, and there's no nothing for us to bite into here other than yuck, a dead body. Um, some of the descriptions were good. Um, some stories kinda, biting into the dead body would be fine, but <laughs> <laughs> the. Uh, flavor and and the salt and you kind of it, it really uh started getting into horror territory and i don't think that's at all where this piece is going um i do find the aspect of you know the sci-fi with the um i don't know more fantasy setting uh interesting especially with the drone like why is there a drone protecting bodies like that yeah, i like that nice suggestion of some kind of strange culture mixed with technology which is a big draw for me and actually may have kept me from raising my hand earlier because i was like okay there's some stuff about this that is interesting um so in my opinion this piece has a lot of potential but you you really uh, need to introduce, you know, the conflict sometime before the end of that third paragraph. All right. Thank you very much. Let's move on to our next submission. The paraesthesis glitch worked its way along the walls, revealing the spackled drywall beneath. You have been logged out, displayed like wallpaper. Without para, I wasn't even spared the clothes on my back, my skin chafing against the coarse linen base the silk charada designed suit dissolved into. Even the rug had its para woven details replaced with the same disturbing statement. It had to be a malfunction. My subscription should have cleared until the end of the month. The furniture disagreed, stripping down one notch more to its wired backing. So bare bones like I had been transported back to the hut after my home island drowned. I hoped living as Joachim would have spared me those memories. From the window, the island sun made its slow squeeze up the sky, but I only saw the long shadows it cast. In the hallway, Victorian, colonial, and Dutch doors stood proud in their hinges, looking in judgment back at my own door. Reduced to an unevenly stained slab of cheap pine, when the servers crashed a decade ago, the whole building went ugly. Not now. Now it was only my rental unit. Too local for a crash to explain the glitch. All my books vanished, along with the shelves, leaving no trace of my past or present. Where once were many millions of cherished words, only these remained. Please connect to an account on file. I worked too hard to be that poor little boy again. Worse. A poor man. All right, I'm obviously spending way too much time reading, <laughs> not paying attention to what's else going on. Um, no, I, I think this is setting up what could be a very, very interesting story. I mean, the idea that everything in your home and in your environment is sometime, somehow tied into this account and that you know if you've been logged out 
everything that looks fine and, and rich around you gets transported back um, to what it truly is, is kind of an interesting idea to me. Um, it's not something that it, it feels new and fresh. It doesn't feel like something that I've read a whole lot of now. I mean, Jason and my cat may have another opinion on that, but um, it, it makes me, and obviously we see like getting this fixed could be, is going to be like the struggle in this story or it could be. Um, but it, it, it immediately made me question. It's like, well, okay. So he doesn't want to go back to being that poor little boy that he was. He doesn't want to be a poor man, but if nothing that you own is, is really rich or of quality, it's all really this, this very cheap material. Do you really have any wealth? Like, and that's a, that's an interesting concept that could really be kind of played with in this story. Um, and I would be interested to keep reading to see if that maybe what is true wealth um, is something that would be further looked at and questioned. But obviously the story could go completely in a different direction. That may have nothing to do with what it's about. But that would be an interesting concept to me is if that is explored through the story. Because if all it takes is an internet crash for everything you have to disappear and to be traded for stuff that is very cheap and of poor quality, then have you really bettered yourself at all? You know, are this, you? This is kind of like it, it. It's almost like a classic basis for an apex story, really. Uh, what happens when technology breaks and we are leaning into it Everybody too much? Take notes. <laughs> Which is maybe where that's that's why my brain is immediately going heading that direction. Like, ooh, are we going to get a really good? kind of conflict here of what is true wealth have you really bettered yourself if all it takes is one crash to take everything down all you have to do is be logged out and you have nothing um so that's like an interesting way that it could go and i'm kind of curious to see if that is how it goes well uh i agree with everything you just said about the concept leslie uh like jason and my hand like shot up at the exact same time and uh, you know, I can't speak for Jason, but I know, you know, what what happened to me was we got to, you know, the furniture disagreed, stripping down one more notch to its wire backing. So bare bones, like I had been transported back to the hut after my home island drowned. And I'm like, OK, well, you know, our narrator, there's, you know, our. It seemed to me that what would be happening this is this is of course my subjective editorial judgment is that what would what would be happening at this moment is that our narrator would be saying would would be saying oh my god what's going wrong how do i stop this instead of sitting there going hmm this is just like when i was a kid now you know so <laughs> it, this this to me that was the wrong moment to to start the reminiscing which yeah, is the same did, thing I that, harped in. Yeah, that in, did make me pause. But I mean, I I was willing to stick with it and go, okay, well maybe their background has scarred them so much that it's always there. Um, so I was willing to go past that. Yeah, but, sometimes the concept will carry the reader a little right. further than maybe they should. It should. Well, I I was kind of. I would be willing perfectly to roll with those details being inserted if they were kind of if if you know you know if not that I'm trying to write the story for this person but just for example if it was like you know as 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 I pounded on my keyboard and nothing happened you know the images straight from my horrible childhood rose around me you know if you follow what I'm saying there but instead this is a very passive sort of you know, sort of, hmm, you know, now it that's how it read to me. And so that's why I checked out. For me, it was simply that I thought we have 250 words here that could have been said in maybe 50. And also a good point. Um, so much of this felt extraneous in the moment. 
I'm sure all, all, much of this is important, but you got to balance uh, writing. Okay, sorry, back up a little bit. You have to balance pushing the narrative forward with dropping in character and world details. And this piece, as Mike was pointing out, tries to smush all that background stuff in when in the foreground is the stuff that we, as the reader, really want to know more about. That's a great way to put that. One detail that did pop out at me as being super creative and clever is the the um, description of the halls and the, the doors in the hallway and how everybody kind of picked a different style. I was like, I like that. Like, that was a detail that I was like, that I like, that everybody's picking, you know, if you could choose any sort of style. And, you know, I, I did like that. So there's a lot to like in this story. Uh, the concept is really interesting and, and the thematic uh, question that it's raising, if indeed that is what it's going to be carried through, uh, leaves a lot to like here. Uh, but um, some of the um, core elements of making a story work needs to be addressed in it as well. Excellent input. Judges, are we ready for our next submission? All right, let's move on. The girls of our town float down the middle of the street, cheap fabric wings pinned to their backs. I watch them walk, hobbled by the coat hanger curves that refuse to bend with the bow of their backs. I see Min towards the back. She's been doing this for a decade now, and even though the orange and black of her wings has dulled with age, she still looks more beautiful than anyone else. Usually, Main Street is covered in fabric flowers and fluorescent paint speckles the sidewalks. There are stands selling pieces of red ribbon tied to dowel rods and paper cutouts of butterflies, bees, and flowers litter the ground. It's quieter this year. The wind storms are getting worse food is growing scarce, and people are giving up on the bees. There's a single peddler set up down the street. He bikes in every bee season, pulling a rust-colored wagon behind him that's piled high with salvaged wood and bits of scrap metal. Used to be he'd get so surrounded during the parade that you'd have to force your way through to get one of the little honey-colored candies he always had. Now there's only a few stragglers. I want to walk over, but my paws standing next to me watching him too, face etched in a deep scowl. The peddler's got other stuff sometimes, secret stuff, the sort of stuff my paw doesn't want me anywhere near. <laughs> I think we I, all three had that reaction. <laughs> I felt like the first sentence was promising me a story that everything past that wasn't giving me. Um, like you know, the first sentence, the girls of our town float down the middle of the street. I was looking for them to be floating <laughs> like um, <laughs> I had that thought too <laughs> and, and then I, I I felt let down when they weren't <laughs> um like I, I was oh man now I can't even remember the name of the story that we had um but I, I was looking for this to be more of a magical realism story than it feels like it, it is. It's setting it up to be, um, which, which is totally um, my bad. <laughs> like, you know, maybe I was putting way too much expectations on that, that first line, but it was just like after I got through that first line, I was like, 
um, immediately thought, oh, this is going to be something sort of like um, what Damien Angelica Walters does, where, I mean, we're talking about girls literally floating. Um, and I was really excited for that. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with with the, the first line at all, but it, in my mind, set up an expectation that didn't follow through. Um, it seems like what we're, we're coming into is some sort of bee festival. And obviously, with um, the way the world is and the way the climate is changing, the festival is going downhill as things are getting harder because the bees aren't there. Um, which is fine. That's a perfectly wonderful story idea to, to, to go with. I just felt like that first line set me up for going into a very um, magical realism type place and that we're getting a story that maybe is more just near future, unfortunately, um, and is much more realistic than what I was, my expectations were. Um, I think that first line is a, is a little bit a victim of a problem that is very specific to genre stories. You know, when you when you open a story with say he rocketed down the street, you know, and maybe you're thinking that you're 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 describing running, and the person is saying, "Hmm." The reader is like, "Well, how do we mean this?" Uh, <laughs> so, and I had I had that same reaction where after a couple sentences, I was like, "Oh, metaphorically floating." <laughs> um i am still uh at by the end of this segment kind of intrigued by this by, by this situation with this kind of de depressing uh b festival where our narrator is you know apparently at risk of being able to you know acquire hard drugs or whatever this forbidden substance that is alluded to uh you know is going to turn out to be um, you know, I, I'm, uh, again, I'm, you know, this, this is again, another opening that's a little bit in info dumpy, but, uh, you know, the details are interesting. So I had not checked out yet. Um, uh, strangely enough, I had no problem with the opening, but, and this is I think this is important for writers to understand that writing uh, a first line like that that might mislead a reader is surely a quick way to dis cause the reader to become disinterested um, as we see with Leslie and Mike to some extent um, so be careful with that uh, to quick way to get you know a, a first reader to just reject you um i really don't see anything in here in these first three paragraphs that tell us that this is a this well we know it's a dystopia but that it's some kind of magical realism piece and genre readers in general, have an expectation to know what kind of story they're reading within the first 250 words. Because uh, there are a gazillion different genres, and we all have our favorites, and we're all limited in the time we have, and there's five billion different uh, things that want us to read it. So um, you got to just play your cards up front sometimes. And it doesn't do that here. Uh, but in the story's favor, I was totally bought in uh, for those first two paragraphs. Uh, there's some wonderful um, images and just solid sentence by sentence writing. Uh, but by the third paragraph, I was thinking, OK, it's time to expose the story a little bit more. And it didn't happen. Um, we get some telling stuff about the paw and, and uh, the good stuff um, that Paul doesn't want character to have, 
Um, I think here you need to switch into a more uh, active voice, start having some dialogue, perhaps um, some more um, environmental details to build on that dystopian feel. Um, but my overall, assumption, you know, no, sorry, my, my, my assumption was that the, the mention of the secret stuff was kind of the, the barb on the hook. And then I guess a lot would depend on what happens next in terms of how that gets yeah. revealed. The thing is, you know, right, We the reader knows that this is a dystopian piece, but this secret stuff could just be some kind of weird crank or <laughs> amalgamation <laughs> of various drugs. It doesn't necessarily have to be something magical, you know, at this point. So we can't tell, you know. Right, right. Very interesting. Are we ready to move to our next excerpt? Sure. All right, let's go. Alicia speared a chunk of meatloaf and lifted the fork. She took a shallow sniff. It smelled like home, oregano and basil liberally mixed with the ground beef. It had a glaze of caramelized ketchup that looked like it should. It was supposed to be comforting, but she couldn't bring herself to take a bite. Her mouth was full of ashes. I haven't been dead for very long, she said, addressing her plate. Oh, honey, your mind ain't settled yet. You should eat. The tall, pale woman with a gray, streaked, dark ponytail served herself a generous helping and took two steps from stove to table to sit across from Alicia. And you're not dead. Not anymore, remember? I thought you understood that. The woman leaned back, the chair audibly flexing under the stress of her large body. She reached behind her and tore a paper towel off the roll standing on the edge of the counter. She ripped it in half. Napkin? Alicia set the meatloaf-laden fork down and accepted the quasi-napkin with a nod. She was sitting on her left hand, holding it still. The woman, who said she was her father's sister, fell into eating her meal. Every small sound of Aunt Jane's chewing and breathing was trapped by the low ceiling and narrowness of the trailer. The intimacy of noises made Alicia yearn for the empty quiet of the morgue she'd so recently left. How long does it take? She asked, making herself swallow. I have to question why this author started with the description of meatloaf um, <laughs> because I very, very nearly just raised my hand. Like, yeah, I know what meatloaf is. Like I've made a hundred meatloafs at least in my lifetime at Halloween. I make them in the shape of a man. Like I know what meatloaf is. Um, the, I haven't been dead for very long line saved it for me. Like I almost feel like if that line was first and then a, a briefer description of the meatloaf. Um, but I really, really question why we're opening with the description of the meatloaf. Um, beyond that, it started to to get me because obviously, you know, here's this, this aunt telling her that, you know, she's not dead anymore. And, and he's telling her that she needs to eat. And it sounds like Alicia maybe doesn't want to be alive again, which is intriguing. Like that you prefer being dead at the morgue. Like that to me is a very, very um, compelling idea. Like why, why do you enjoy being dead at the morgue more than being whatever you are now. Um, I do wonder, like you, she's saying, she's this woman who said she was her sis, her father's sister. Um, why is she not knowledgeable of her aunt? Like, why is the aunt like some sort of questionable figure? So there are things that I, I could be interesting 
or it just might be strange like why you know what i mean so if the author does it well like why she doesn't know her father's sister if there is some reason behind that it could be a very very compelling part of the story um but there does need to be a reason behind it because if not it just becomes this thing where the reader's going well i don't understand why they don't know who their aunt is um but yeah my, my biggest takeaway from this is that first paragraph just about lost me real quick like I feel like that that line like I haven't been dead long needs to be moved up and then if you you know then you can have her staring at her fork and give a very brief description but um I don't think starting with a description of food is the best way to go unless it's a story about food (laughs) well I like an unconventional opening and so I actually kind of liked starting out with a description of food just because genre stories rarely do that however uh when we got to the line her mouth was full of ashes i mean that is that is a cliched sentence you know that's that's a phrase that's been used over and over again and my my hand almost went up and then we got that i haven't been dead for very long and i was like oh well let's see where this is going Mm -hmm. um and and i i felt like i've you know, obviously, I, I as as a writer and to, and to some degree as an editor, I work in the weird, the genre, the weird. And this this feels like it could be the opening of a weird capital W story, uh, where you have somebody who's back, as you mentioned, Leslie, who's back from the dead and pretty depressed about it. <laughs> That's kind of intriguing. Um, you know, so so I I was willing to keep I was willing to keep going past that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I would be, I would at least, you know, by the end of this continue reading, you know, much of course depends on what happens next. Hmm. Uh, so I think here we have a classic case of, let's just go ahead and draw a big red X to the entire first paragraph. And also, uh, let's put a big red X through the fourth paragraph and rework what's left. Um, I, you know, I, the meatloaf thing and the ketchup, if, if you had brought that in together, you know, it can be a nice image like as a metaphor for dead body. I don't know uh, if you're operating on that high level or, um, or, you know, you start with, I haven't been dead for very long. She said, shoveling a chunk of meatloaf and of ketchup top meatloaf into her mouth or something like that. You know, obviously spice that up a little bit, but, I think that would work better as your opening and you get your meatloaf too. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm thinking of that. Uh, the, the Rocky horror picture show, uh, uh, you know, line, not meatloaf again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> and I'm thinking our, our new tagline for snap judgment is, and you get your meatloaf too. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. great. Uh, her mouth was full of ashes was a grown worthy line. Holy moly. Sorry to the person that wrote this, but that's, mm -mm, mm. Uh, that probably would have stopped a lot of editors. Um, And I'd like to say that by the end of it, you know, she keeps talking about, you know, I left, recently left the morgue and I was dead and I'm dead and I'm dead. I'm like, I get it. You're dead. Let's move on. Let's get this narrative rolling. So that's why I raised my hand. Unless you can't move on and that's the narrative. I guess we'll find <laughs> out. She, she's stuck in this eating meatloaf with her aunt for eternity. Meat, meatloaf hell. <laughs> <laughs> Is that t- is that ten stories? Is no. it time to switch? I know I'm supposed to keep track. I Number ten is. is the next one. Oh, okay. I have one more. All right. Yeah. 
All we'll right. switch after this next one. Okay. All right. Brisbane's Queen Street Mall was empty, dead at 7.15 p.m. All the people had scattered into the suburbs like dropped iron filings until the morning when the money magnet would draw them together again. Empty people places, like the weeknight CDB, made Iain Payne nervous. All those ordinary people, busy with work during the day, now with time on their hands behind closed doors. Time for pleasures. Time for sin. Iain thought about sin a lot. It was his job. He looked to the time tat on the inside of his wrist, and then to the red pavers passing under his feet, when he almost ran into a woman standing by herself outside of the Regent's cinema. Her attractiveness, somehow augmented by the veil of blue smoke hanging in the air from the gasper clinched between her fingers. Iain smiled. She glared back. Piss off! Iain might have stopped, horrified that someone had misread him, seen him as a perv, rather than a sin hunter. Sin hunters, modern-day paladins, holy crusaders, feared by the worst criminals. Yes, he was a sin hunter. He could have stopped to tell her so, or at least give her the chance to recognize him from the six o'clock news, where the ABC had interviewed him to get his take on the night before the agony. Ian would have stopped if he wasn't running so late for a dinner date with his unity partner, Helen Leon. All right. Um, if I hadn't been busy taking notes, my hand probably would have been up. Um, I just like the description of the mall being dead empty at seven fifteen, and I, it it didn't feel super fresh to me. I do. I am slightly intrigued by the idea of a sun hunter. Like, because at first when he is, it says at the top, um, at the end of the first paragraph that he thought about sin a lot. It was his job. Immediately, my mind went to like, okay, this is a demon who's trying to get people to commit sin. So then to have that flipped and instead he's a sin hunter. He's somebody who's hunting out sin. I, I did like that. I thought that was a little bit more interesting than what I initially um, was set up for. The one thing, though, that, that I, I kept getting hung up on is he's incredibly full of himself. Um, incredibly, incredibly full of himself. And... That just made me wonder, like, how good of a sun hunter is he if he is just so focused on on himself? Um, overall, I mean, I just I, I, I didn't feel like this was setting it up in a way that would have kept me reading for much longer. Well, I, I didn't get through the first paragraph before my hand went up. Uh, I just. Uh, you know, there, there's no, uh, you know, there, there's, there's no setting a scene. There's no sharing a detail that I find intriguing enough to, to, to make me want to keep going. It's just, it's just kind of this, it's just kind of this snarky description of what sounds like, you know, something, something so everyday you know, I could just go walk downtown and <laughs> see see an empty downtown waiting for businesses to open up in the morning. You know, it, 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 I just uh, one of one of the one of the inherent cruelties of the slush process is that there's you know there there are so many stories in line that if that if a story hasn't you know personally for me if a story hasn't grabbed me you know, by the end of the first paragraph, I'm definitely not going further. And that was my reaction here. Um, so in the first line or two of a story, um, you need to establish two or three things, um, your character, your setting, or the situation. Um, 
and yes, you you do that in this piece, but it's very clumsily done. Um, and my hand kind of flew up at that very first um, awkward metaphor about the dropped iron fillings and the money magnet. It it just just did not work for me. Um, so instead, you know, just have it simple with Ian walking down the street in the business sets, you know, in the business district of Cindy. I mean, it doesn't have to be anything uh, mind blowing. Uh, we're all wired to think uh you know as writers that we need to have this like killer hook at the start one you need to have the hook in the first couple hundred words it doesn't have to be in the first line or two so you if you just do that that uh that way you have ian and you have the setting you know a quiet business district um and that way you get to avoid some of the more awkward metaphors and words, empty people places like the weak not CVDB. Uh, it's just a mouthful. Um, his attitude, his cockiness didn't really turn me off. Um, it, it, it felt kind of tropish, actually, to me. Um, I've seen this character a lot, uh, which isn't why uh i raise my hand it's just that it's one i you know i'm familiar with which can also work to your favor um in that you uh, maybe uh don't have to make some of his actions so snide huh uh but you know work on just the uh opening and and your um, descriptors. I, I feel a need to add, uh, like the very next thing that happens, the, look, essentially the very first actual event in the story is, you know, Ian almost runs into a woman. She says, piss off. He frets that she thinks he's a perv. This doesn't strike me as anything that is adding to a story. Or, or 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 helping me to get to know a character uh so so uh you know something that more illustrated who he is or what he does i think would be the way to go mm-hmm. i agree with that yeah next next so starting with this story mike you'll be the first judge oh, to give I'll, your feedback and then Jason i'll be in the pole Mike. position okay 46 days. That's how long I have left to live. It's strange knowing the exact date and time of your impending death. Most people can't even face the fact that they're going to die, much less know when it will happen. If you knew the exact date of your incoming death, if you knew how many days you had left, what would you do? What would you change? Could you? There's a calendar on the wall outside my cell. One of the cheap kinds you can pick up at any dollar store for a buck. This one features a kitten. We have all three hands raised. So, um, I mean, the way that this opens, you know, this is how long I have left to live. Isn't it strange knowing exactly what you're going to die? Would you change anything if you knew? I mean, this, I mean, talk about, talk, talk about, you know, a, a very familiar kind of overdone trope, a- and on on top of that, this this kind of television, this 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 kind of television narrator, this you know omniscient television narrator opening that you know the kind of thing that Rod Serling might might have delivered at the beginning of of a Twilight Zone episode. Uh, you know this. In 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 2021, I mean, there's no such thing as like, I mean, you can break rules, 
but it, but in 2021, this kind of thing just doesn't really work as the opening of 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 a short story, unless there's something really incredibly unusual and gripping about it. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and so I checked out basically, you know, right then and there, you know, I feel like, I, I feel like as a reader and as a consumer of genre media, I've actually been challenged with this question many, many times. And so I'm, I'm not particularly in, intrigued in checking out what this 100th variation is going to be. Um. So I stopped reading. Yeah, um, I agree. Uh, this intro is tired and um, cliched. Uh, it feels like the narration to a crappy ABC attempt at a um, YA show or something. That has, After school special. Or, or a CW like sci-fi thing. Um, I don't really mean that to be harsh, but, uh, it's just how I feel. Um, I did wait to raise my hand because I saw that, you know, once we get to the third chapter, you get, and you get that like background CW-ness out of your system. Uh, the story actually starts to, to roll and I would just. I wanted to read the list, the people viewing to to hear, you know, what I think uh, should be where your story starts. And um, I hope you take this criticism with um, the good nature and help that we intend it. Uh, I agree with Jason and Mike. I I found the the immediacy of like well i know exactly when i'm going to die how much more time i have to live you know nobody how would you <clears throat> react if you knew exactly how much time um i just kind of felt like i've read that like a lot so you would need to immediately pick it up and make it interesting if that's the concept you're going to go for and instead it just was this litany of questions and immediately i was just like huh it just made me feel very weary and so i was like pass yeah i, I i'm not going to keep going when what it feels like an, an overused convention if you aren't immediately going to switch it up and give me something that excites me and makes me say oh okay maybe it feels like I've read this, but maybe they're going to give me a twist I haven't seen before, and that didn't come. And in, instead, you just barraged us with, with questions. Yeah, have, you know, if you're going to using a you know a cliched or often uh, utilized format like this, you know, you can do it, but you have to do it in a way where um, you get the readers to buy into the story you're telling before you lean too hard into that trope. Does that make sense? Um, so, you know, open up about the calendars, you know, give us a little idea about uh, an immediate conflict and then tie that conflict in with the fact that, you know, her candle wick is a burning toward the end. Make us care about her first, and then you might be able to get away with the cliched kind of plot background. Hmm? Mike's like, eh, well, it's uh, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just. I, I scanned ahead after, you know, listening to you talk about the, the third paragraph and I thought, well, OK, so if this opened with, you know, the guard put the calendar up as a cruel joke. Well, that's, you know, that's something concrete to, to latch into. And, you know, there's there's certainly nothing wrong about there's there, there's there's certainly nothing wrong about writing a story about 
people on death row, uh, you know, been done very effectively in many occasions, but this just wasn't the way to open it up. All right, thank you very much. Let's move on. When the giant carcass is dragged out of the ocean by rusted chains, when the whale's boat-sized tail scrapes a line in the sand as gulls squawk and circle overhead, Taiwan's environment minister, Huang Fu, wonders if it's the last he'll see. Just outside the no-fish zone, minister, a windswept civil servant tells him, his black suit rippling like a kite. No marks on its body. Must be natural causes. Huang Fu breathes in the salty air of the Hualien coast. Thank God, he says, his hand raking through his thinning hair, imagining the fallout if it had been killed so close to the local elections. I want a full autopsy and no press anywhere near this. Sea spray slowly drenches him, aggravating a shaving cut close to his Adam's apple. He rushed out this morning, keen as always to get out of the empty apartment. The biggest creature Huang Fu has ever seen, that the world has ever seen, is flopped onto its back as a team of marine biologists move in carrying large tools that flash sharp and jagged in a fleeting ray of sunlight. When they cut open the tire-thick blubber to expose the whale's pungent stomach, blood darkening the sand, it is a harpoon to Huang Fu's heart. It's not the thousands of plastic bottles in all shapes and colors, nor the bird nest spools of fishing line and weed darkened nets. It's the small child with her eyes closed, a red raincoat wrapped tightly around her. So my hand didn't go up, but I'm a little confused about what's happening. Uh, so I might be, I might be reading in part, continue reading in part for that reason. Um, and I feel like there's an there's an intriguing situation here, but because of some word choices, I don't fully grasp what's going on. But maybe and maybe I'm supposed to be grasping what's going on. Um, just uh, uh, an example in that first paragraph, uh, Taiwan's environment minister Huang Fu wonders if it is the last he'll see. It took me a little while to figure out that it meant the whale. I'm like, what is he going to lose his vision? <laughs> um, and so, so, but as it continued, I think it became, uh, I think, I think it became clear that that meant the the whale. But then, uh, and we have this bit about imagining the fallout had been killed so close to the local elections. So there's certainly a situation here. I mean, I think I know what we're talking about, but maybe not. You know, depending on on you know what what era of uh, time period this is supposed to be taking place, uh, but then but then we get to this: the biggest creature Huang Fu has ever seen that the world has ever seen is flopped onto its back. And I'm like, okay, now wait a minute. You know, up at the top, we're kind of reacting like, okay, here's another whale that's been killed, and but then we get this bit seemingly almost randomly thrown in there of like this is the largest whale ever seen by mankind I'm like well maybe she maybe if that is in fact what this is trying to say maybe that's what we should lead with uh and so and so then we get to uh then the, then we get to the the whale being cut open and apparently there's a small child with her eyes closed either on the beach or inside the whale, I I can't tell. So I I guess what I'm saying is I think there's there's an intriguing, seems to be an intriguing situation of some kind here. But I'm I'm because of, you know, maybe another round of polish would help me understand what is happening. Um, yeah, you know, and unless there's some reason for writing it this way, that's going to be cleared up in a few paragraphs, but it better get cleared up. Yeah. So what you're describing is something that I, I often harp about in workshops I do, and it's the precision of writing. Uh, you have to be clear on what you're wanting to say. So here we had an instance of Mike, the reader. Uh, 
in a piece that he seems to otherwise enjoy just being thrown out of the story because he's confused by um, some of the um, pronouns, basically, uh, and some of the loose writing. So, you know, tighten up uh, the descriptions here. And I think, um, at least in on a mechanical level, you will have gotten past some of the problems. Um, yeah, the in in you know the indefinite and kind of abandoned um, modifiers that were going on threw me off, but. Overall, I was 100% in. Um, I I, re- I happen to really enjoy environmental fiction, and I thought you know some of the questions raised here was were very interesting, and I assumed that this giant whale is due to some kind of genetic anomaly caused by pollution, chemicals, you know, what have you. Um, and, you know, having a small child in a red raincoat kind of appear. I thought that was a pretty good hook towards the end. Um, the red raincoat kind of felt a little bit cliche. Um, but compared to the color palette that you have set up, it definitely stands out at that point. So in that manner, it really worked for me. Um, I wanted to give you kudos for rippling like a kite, which really gives us the sense that they're on a beach. Um, something I would have liked is some olfactory senses pulled in. Uh, this thing is going to stink the high heavens. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's going to be seagulls going fucking nuts. Uh, and, <laughs> um, and they cut open that body, you know, but I think, you know, there was a great scene in, uh, the boys on the Amazon where they run straight through a well, <laughs> it just explodes and it was disgusting and, uh, I'm like, maybe watch that for a little inspiration uh, to get the uh, the uh, senses going. Um, the, the right whale corpse feel. That's right. <laughs> uh, but I think you've got a great story here. And for our viewers, um, I want to share the title that I thought I found the title to be actually pretty intriguing. Tiny Footprints in Sand and Time. I thought that's pretty evocative, you know, and with the opening, uh, it worked for me. What about you, Leslie? Um, Unlike Mike and Jason, I didn't take it that this particular whale was more gigantic than other whales. I more took it that whales in general are the most enormous creatures that we're going to see so like i it it didn't occur to me that they meant this whale this this that this in particular whale was the actual biggest creature that they'd seen i just took that as they were they were meaning whales in general um the 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 wording that the world has ever seen is is what threw me right and and i get that like when you were talking about that i was like oh okay because I think that's pretty clear. How else yeah. are they going to say this is the largest whale seen in the history of mankind? Right, right. <laughs> I just took it to mean that they, the, the whales in general, I mean, let's face it, whales in general are gigantic. And if you've not stood next to one, you're going to be in awe of how gigantic they are, whether this one, I mean, because, you know. I mean, maybe I'm reading it wrong, but I was just... Well, I mean, you can make a case that the the character is being hyperbolic there, but the the tone of the intro does not lead me to that 
conclusion. I would agree with that too. Yeah. Sam, are you reading? It's all right. Sorry. I, mean, I just didn't take it to mean that this particular whale. I just took it to mean that 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 this that whales in general are the largest creatures on Earth at this time. Um, so anyway, that's another way it could be written again, like this is one thing that, you know, it's good to get feedback on is you've got three different readers and you've got one who's reading it completely different than the other two. Um, whereas, you know, my, in my mind immediately, the little girl, I think is very obvious that she's inside the whale because they're talking about plastic bottles or the spools of fishing line or the nets. Well, those are things that we know as a society kill whales because they ingest them. Um, and so when then it goes on to describe that that's not what they're seeing, they're seeing this little girl in a red raincoat. To me, that makes it very, very clear that the little girl is inside the whale. Or am I reading? I mean, no. I I don't disagree with you. I just I I just think the there's the way this is sort of phrased. You know, uh, when they cut open the tire thick of blubber, it is a harpoon to Huang Fu's heart. You know, uh, the, you know th that's that's kind of a curiously passive phrase. You know, and then you know that and then we sort of, I mean, to my mind, and of course I'm a different editor from from from. From Jason and Leslie, and and this is the That's HX why you're here. event. So you're to you be know, the contrary. If you're if you're if you're wanting if you're wanting to sell, you know, please be paying attention to what they say. But but to my mind, to to my mind, the way that this is described is not like a, you know, a a logical pro progression. In in that, it seems to me like the very first thing I'm going to react to to the exclusion of all else when I see the corpse of a little girl inside the stomach of a whale, you know, is, is going to be the sight of the girl, not, you know. It's, we don't it's, know that it's a corpse. There's nothing yeah. that says she's dead. Right, well. Her I eyes mean, are closed. Well, that's true, but, you know, that's that gets to even more of the and ambiguity so, that I found kind of maddening here. <laughs> but to me, it's really intriguing because he doesn't yeah. seem surprised. He seems heartbroken. But he doesn't necessarily seem surprised to see the child. Right, right. So, well, depending on so what that happens to next, me sets yeah. this story I don't know. Up. He, it's a yeah. harpoon to his heart. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> um, it, it I affected that him. Is, that is <laughs> as grief. As, as like, but oh, I agree. It happened you don't again. know that she's dead. Yeah. Right, well, no, I mean, we don't know that she's well, dead. Well, now that you've brought that up, I agree with you. We don't know that. Or I do agree. agree. Yeah. We have this, you know, it, to me, this sets this up where it could be going in a really, really interesting way because obviously he's heartbroken that this whale has died. There's obviously some sort of political reasoning behind why the whales can't be dying. And then you have this little girl who is the cause. Okay. So that could take this in a really, because she is the thing inside him, not the fishing nets. It's not, you know, plastic bottles. It is that we would normally think would kill the whales because they're ingesting him. So why is this little girl in there? And it, cause like I said, it does not say she's dead. So do we have like a plague of, red raincoat little girls out there oh murdering whales <laughs> well obviously the what obviously this piece has really fired kind of your imagination <laughs> as, as to what the possibilities could be whereas my reaction was just more like i i don't get what's going on here <laughs> so <laughs> you know whoever wrote this be sure to put this story in front of leslie and not me <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> yeah. this story could go in so many ways but i really the way it is reading to me is this sense of this these little girls this little girl because i don't feel like this is the first one he's seen is in some way causing these deaths and 
you know, you know, you think of children as being innocent, but let's face it, children can really put a damper on things sometimes. Um, <laughs> they can. Um, so if she's not dead, like if his grief is for the whale, which is how I read it, <clears throat> and not for this little girl, like if she's not dead. So then why, what is the phenomenon that is causing whale murdering girls in raincoats i guess I, next time we're I, going to have to extend the word limit to 275 so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so that we, we know one what, way or the other because like we don't yeah. know at this point we don't know whether she's alive or dead and i think that that's pivotal for the entire story mm -hmm. interesting point well, if in the very next sentence she like opened her eyes and said, oops, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and then that skips would... away to go murder again, you know, you don't know that could be what happens. Uh, just to give an example of the kind of stuff the editors have to consider, something that came up was I know whales have a very small larynx throat or whatever. Can a small child fit through one? So, you know, obviously we can just Wikipedia that, but if I were to accept the story and was editing it, I would have to go and research that. <laughs> well, again, you're making the assumption. I mean, is it, you would think. Was she magically appeared it, in the belly? But, I mean, well, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know how she got in there. This is true. Uh, okay, I'll give you that. I still think it's kind of ambiguous where the child is as it's currently written. Um, <laughs> so we we well, ended up spending um, a lot of time on this one. We <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our, okay, well, but disagreements it's happen. One. It's it's probably important for people to see that different editors will have wildly different takes on the same piece. You know. Yeah. And that's why we're very uh, appreciative that you joined us. Um, unfortunately, we have reached the end of this particular uh, snap judgment session. So I'm oh, going goodness. to have Andrea wrap things up for us. Well, I want to thank, say thank you to everyone who submitted a submission for today's event. Again, apologies that we couldn't get through everybody's submissions. I want to thank our judges today, and I want to thank everyone who joined to watch this live stream. I hope our judges' comments were educational and helpful to everyone. If you enjoyed what you saw and heard here today, 